Hi, welcome to Doc NYC's 2022 Spring Showcase, our mid-year celebration of documentary film and series. I'm Ruth Samalo, Senior Features Programmer at Doc NYC, and it's my great pleasure to be speaking today with director and executive producer Chris Smith, who will tell us all we want to know about the amazing docu-series Bad Vegan, which is brought to us by Netflix. Hello, Chris, how are you? Hello, good. <laughs> So before we go into the particular details of this series and the production, I wanted to start by acknowledging, you know, some of your very exciting and prolific portfolio of documentaries about underdog heroes that get either crushed by their own kind of like wrongdoings or external circumstances. And I'm thinking, for example, about the amazing activist of the Yes Men, my favorite con artists, um, the indie Milwaukee, you know, filmmakers of American movie or the deluded entrepreneurs of fire you know, like your involvement also like in the boy who sold the world or like the colorful, deeply flawed characters we've all loved uh, from Tiger King. And now you brought us this unlikely, incredible rise and fall story of a great restaurateur and businesswoman, Sarma. So in a way, let's start by, by you telling us a little bit about what is it about these particular characters that continues to inspire you and what have you learned from them? Yeah, I think none of it, um... There's not like a predetermined thesis where I'm, you know, thinking that this is the type of person or story that I'm trying to tell. For me, it's really always been instinctual. I feel like if I'm interested or curious about something, you know, that I, I would hope that an audience might be as well. Um, you know, recently we had done the surfing series with Garrett McNamara, which was also is also, you know, one of these characters that was trying to do this impossible task and sort of following on that journey. And I think through that process, you realize that you know, the, the, whether he achieved the goal or not wasn't really the point of the story. It was sort of just everything that happens around that. And I think with all these stories, it, it, there's something similar in that way. And uh, how did you get involved in the story of Sarma? Like, at what point did you arrive, you know, into, did you knew about her story? How did you get involved? And, um, you know, what was your initial approach to this story? Yeah, I, I was a huge fan of Sarma's. I, um, I was taken to her restaurant from a friend and it was sort of this like, like entry into another world, you know, it was it, like, we would go to these restaurants and have this somewhat decadent meal in a way, but it was, um, but you left feeling really like energized and, and, and there was this understanding that like eating raw food was, you know, easier on the system and, and it, you know, was, was healthier. And, and so we ended up buying, her cookbooks we had a dehydrator we were like following that for a while and and you know it was interesting to me anytime I'd be in New York we would go to the restaurant um and I remember when the news broke I it was it was inconceivable to me how somebody through just being you know I didn't know Summer but being a fan to see where she where she wasn't in, in, in my experience with her and where she ended up, it, it felt like I couldn't connect the dots, you know? And I remember like seeing the headlines and I was busy and I, you know, that was as far as I really went with it at the time. And then I was out to dinner with a friend who had a friend coming in from England who was friends with Sarma who had sort of acquired the rights to make a documentary about her story. And I agreed to meet up with him just to give him some advice and we hit it off and um, um, you know, he asked if I would be involved and, and it started this very slow process where you know, I said I would go and shoot um, a master interview and sort of, you know, my, my pitch to him was like, I'll go shoot a master interview and if it isn't for me, you can, you can have the footage and, and do with it what you want and if it is, then we can figure out how to work together. And so it really was an odd, like evolution of how it all came together. And going back to that master interview, I think something <clears throat> something I really like about the series is that it's really beautifully orchestrated as a choral story, like the different people telling the story, but there is two main narrators. In a way, there is the super like reliable narrator, like Alan Sorkin, a journalist from Vanity Fair, and then the potentially unreliable, unreliable narrator um, of the of the main character telling her own story, and you know you kind of like have them like you know telling the core of the story, and then everyone else like the family members, the people that work with them are kind of like giving us like all the details and kind of like the way that they saw it from the outside. So tell us a little bit about 
just like from that master interview that you crafted, which I presume is the one that you did before you knew that yeah. you were even going to be in, involved in the in the story. Um, how was the construction of like all these little tentacles of the story and going like from telling the story from the inside to tell the story from the outside? Well, I, I, you know, we only knew what we knew from Sarma at the very beginning. So we actually did two interviews. We did them, I think, about a year apart, but we sort of, um, you know, were able to go back with everything that we had learned over the last year. Um, you know, yeah, you're, you're right. Like those are the two sort of constant, consistent voices. Um, but I think for us, it was it was a real process of discovery of just talking to so many people that had so many like a front row seat to this experience, and it, and 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 it was and it, everyone's experience was so different, you know. Um, and I, I think it, for us, it was a real journey where I remember being like a year, a year and a half into it, and the edit team, Ryan Fraser, was uh, the other producer with Mark Ems. Um, we were just constantly having these discussions of trying to piece together what happened because I think it was very hard. I think one of the hardest things in making the series was trying to take the audience on the journey that Sarma went on. You know, I, I think that um, when you look at it on the surface, people are like, how could she have gone down this road? How could she have believed these things? How could she have given him money? And I think we, we tried very hard to try to help the audience understand um, you know, how this could happen to someone. I think with any of these stories, I think trying to make them human and somewhat relatable is, is always a goal because, you know, on, on the surface, they're, they're easy to dismiss. But I think the goal is to try to humanize the experience in the sense of just helping people understand how this, you know, this could potentially happen to you or some, some variation of it. Something that kind of struck me was like the level of like self-awareness of like, these kind of like slippages of like what could be potentially needed at some point as, as evidence, right? And like how, you know, the fact that Sarah and Anthony recorded themselves like from their phone videos to like pictures and recordings, like during meetings or like personal interactions, like trips, you know, in even like before Sarma goes to prison, like in like having the, the foresight of like interviewing herself and preparing some like footage and materials for like a potential you know, a uh, story like, like such as Bad Vegan. So um, how, how do you, you know, how do you see like from, from the, the way that you started making documentaries and the level of awareness and like media savviness that your usual characters have to now where people are like, in a way, always a little bit like taking the role of documentary in their own, their own lives and stories. Um, what do you think has changed in the way we understand like our own storytelling? I think the iPhone has changed everything just because people have a, a camera with them at all times, whether it's a photo or video, there's an ability to record and document things. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting that Sarma had recorded herself before going to prison. You know, I mean, we didn't try to hit people over the head with anything in the, in the, in the series. I think it was, you know, and, and I loved having that footage because it allowed us to give the audience, you know, what she wanted to be portrayed, you know, was within that footage about, you know, the experience that she went through from her perspective of the way that she wanted it communicated. And going towards that, um, just kind of like this, because there's something that you play with, with, with in the series that I really find interesting, which is this idea of the reenactments. And you have like an actor playing, you know, Shane slash Anthony, um, shady guy with glasses through the film. You have some, you know, reconstructions of like potential poker games with her dad, his dad, sorry. Um, kind of like, even like this very kind of like cinematic moments with like a black ops crew of people, you know, like doing some reckoning. So you, even like, even like a, a scene from Thor from like the Hollywood film, right. yeah. which, um, you know, and there's a tension between the, you know, what, how much truth there is in images and how much there isn't and you know what's real and what's not and that kind of like a slippage that we're all like living under you know in this like post-truth kind of world that we inhabit that I find really fascinating that you play with in the film um can you tell us a little bit about those things like those those elements like um you know formal elements that you introduced in the film I think again it, it's going back towards trying to help the audience understand the experience that Sarma was you know, sort of trying to convey that she 
went through. So if if you're looking at like somebody that were to be believing that you know this person was having these missions and um you know I, I i think our attempt in the filmmaking was to sort of take you on that journey you know and i think the best way to do that was through some of these elements because you know for the audience you can start to visualize and feel like that oh this is real you know i think the biggest example of that is is this character will richards where we we had somebody you know anthony uh from everything that we can ascertain, it was it created this character named Will Richards, which was an associate. And part of the goal in, in that, to me, was to say, you know, people watching this show that are thinking, how could you fall for this? You know, if you start to believe that this person is real and then this person is shown to be not real, that it's sort of like almost gaslighting the audience in the sense of, you know, you know, if you look back at him and what he's saying and who he is, it's almost seems very obvious that this was not real, but it's being presented in a documentary as being real and it looks like all the other interviews. So, you you know, that I think the, the goal in that was to, and, and I don't know if it worked for everyone, but I know judging from like online responses that it, it definitely did for a handful at least. And, um, and that I think was an attempt to have the audience go on, you know, a similar experience to the one that Sarma was, you know, felt that she had gone on. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I'm also very intrigued by how, because of these things that we're talking about and the image like no longer holding like, you know, the supreme world of like reality, how the use of text is used as evidence as opposed to images as evidence. And, and like, you know, the diaries, like the emails, like the text messages, the phone calls, yeah. you know, can you tell us a little bit about working with that? Because I really like the way that you bring in, like you use the diary of Sarma and, you know, like from her inner thoughts to you know, that maybe if she will recall them today, they will be transformed, but she wrote them at the very moment where she felt them. Right. That brings a very particular, you know, strong, you know, connection to the way that she was feeling. Tell us a little bit about working with those texts and how they operate, whether or not as evidence or narrative devices or both. Well, I think one of the things that was nice is that you could see like, she would write like, got 10,000 back, very reassuring. And so you see this sort of evolution of, of sort of, how the things were unfolding in real time, as you said. Um, I think, you know, with that material, it, it, it's become such a part of our lives, the way that we communicate through all these different mediums, whether it's text or email or, um, uh, you know, diary, whatever in it. Um, you know, uh, we, uh, we're we just very fortunate to work with a guy named Stefan, Stefan Nadelman, who has a company called Tourist. And, and he is just a complete savant genius. And, and I don't know if a film like this or a series like this could exist without somebody like that sort of bringing that material to life. So we've just felt incredibly lucky and fortunate to have him as a collaborator because he's through almost all of our recent projects, you know, been able to take sort of these modern forms of communication and, and, and make them work within a documentary context. And, um, uh, you know, can you tell us about like the conversations with Sarima herself about like how much like, was she like very open to like, you know, use all these materials from the very beginning? Was it like, was it like a little hard? Because like a lot of the things that she writes about, um, you know, I feel like there is like a level of, of uh, vulnerability in the diary that is not necessarily there in the interview because like the time has passed and like she's suffered everything that she's suffered. So in a way, like how was the dialogue with Sarima and how much was she involved in like, you know, crafting these different elements of the story with you? Um, Sarma was in, you know, almost daily contact with Ryan Fraser, who was the other, uh, one of the other EPs on the, on the series. Um, Ryan and Mark dealt with Sarma, like, very, very frequently. And so I think it was the process of getting materials, it was ongoing through the very end of production, like, things would continue to trickle in. Um, I never got the sense that there was, like, a, a huge withholding of, of anything. I think she felt quite open um, in terms of trying to get, you know, the story told. I think for her, it was important for people to see um, sort of how these, how this came to be and hopefully help other people from avoiding similar fates. You know, I think that, that and, um, you know, Mark, before I had met him, had made a deal with Sarma where for her participation, because there was so much archival material um, through photographs and videos and 
you know, communications that um, where she just wanted an amount of money to go to the trustee to pay back the employees that hadn't been paid. So um, that had been put into place, but, but those were, I think, the two motivating factors for her, as far as I could tell, was, you know, was trying to get people to understand, you know, see warning signs of these sort of things and, and to, you know, get the em employees paid back. Another thing that <clears throat> my mind keep going back while I was watching the show was like these, um, these documentaries I've seen of like cult leaders, so like Nexium and all these like um, different cults that have come to light, like and with like very, you know, um, you know, clever people manipulating people to do all kinds of things and, and believing in all kinds of things. So I was kind of like, in a way, missing that that level of like, well, was she like in a way like brainwashed, like people are in a cult, you know, right. and was there, you know, like I almost wanted to have like an expert, like, and I know I hate like experts in films, like especially yeah. documentaries, but like I wanted somebody that explained how the mind works under pressure and under those conditions of manipulation, you know, and and how one is really not, you know, truly, you know, at will to, to do certain things under those conditions. and. And in a way, I feel like, you know, the way that that um, Anthony Shane operated was more along those lines that that like, you know, with those tactics. So um, is it was there ever like a like a thinking about, you know, bringing in that yeah. kind of like aspects of like the mental states? Yeah, we definitely did. We um, uh, we did go down that road, actually. It, you know, it was for me, I, I find I don't know. I really like trying to present all the information for an audience and let them sort of come to conclusions on their own. I, I, I find it to be somewhat, I don't know. I, I, I like being able to make my own sort of like see, see the information, be, have it presented and make my own sort of formulate my own opinions and thoughts. I, I find when experts come on and tell you how to think, I, I find it insulting and I find it disengaging from the narrative of, of just actually watching the experience, I feel. And the other thing is that, you know, concurrently with us working on the documentary, Sarma had been, has been writing a book. Um, I hope she puts it out. I, um, you know, obviously it would be, I, I would assume that she would be putting a lot of, of that in there. I think she's, um, you know, become a student of course of control and sort of looking at the way that, that those laws work in other countries versus America. And so, you know, I know that that is like very important to her and I and I would assume it's covered. I haven't read the book, um, but you know, to me, I was like, I, I would hope that this would open an opportunity for her to be able to put that out. Um, you know, and I, if she were to want to go back in, you know, we've heard through the grapevine that there's a lot of people that have reached out or had interest in helping restart the restaurant or a version of that. And so to me, it's like, I'm, I'm just hopeful that there's, um, that this, opportunity of exposure can sort of be used as something positive and sort of helping, you know, move into a next chapter, whether that's becoming an author, speaking about this more, opening the restaurant or a combination of all three, you know, that to me would be, you know, the best outcome. And, and to that extent, um, something I'm really interested in is like the process of making a very personal film oftentimes allows, you know, the people making the film to really work on, you know, some of the traumas to really kind of like get clarity on some of the things that happened to themselves. Like, um, can you tell us a little bit about like, uh, how was it for Zarma, like working through the, that incredible episode in her life, you know, and, um, you know, to what extent she felt like, you know, participating in the documentary can like help her get some clarity for herself or like move forward in, in different directions? Well, I think it's, I don't, I, you'd have to ask some of that. I don't know. You know, I mean, Ryan was talking to her on a daily basis. They were very close. Um, and she may have a little more insight to that, but I don't want to speak for some. Yeah, that's something that is very, very clear in the series and like very well crafted too. Like, you know, every in every turn of like something really strange happening, you know, you have like the real, like kind of like the echo of her ecosystem saying like, but she's a great woman. She's, you know, she's an incredible worker, you know, very ethical. We love working with her. We'll like, let, we'll drop everything and follow her. And, and this is consistent, like even yeah. through the years, like from everyone, from like, you know, the investors to the bartenders. And, and, and I think that's, you know, that's something that is really, you know, really important because it speaks to her core, like what she is as a, as a business woman also, and a different way of doing business, of relating to, um, to employees. So it's it's kind of like a like a great contradiction of like holding those two extremes together. Like 
having that very you know wonderful enduring empathetic relationship like kind of horizontal with your workers but also participating in this defrauding you know scheme like unwillingly probably you know but um screwing them in the long run so it's like but that's a, such a it's such a great contradiction it is really well portrayed in the film and something else i wanted you to talk to us a little bit about is like this uh you know all these incredible characters that are part, part of the film you know from yeah. From like Anthony Carroll and Sarmas, Sarmas wants like homeless friend, which is an incredible, you know, character in the in the series too. It's like the, the nicest investor I've ever seen, you know, portray Jeffrey Chodorov to like, you know, the you know, Nassim character, which is like a friendly foe slash friend that turns out to be like the opposite of what we think. Uh, tell us a little bit about like discovering like all these like incredible humans that were, you know, in her in her ecosystem and how you know they participated in the film in the series yeah i mean that was again that like process of discovery and meeting these people and one person would lead to another and it, it was a long road um a lot of it went through early covid which was you know challenging in and of itself which is why jeffrey's interviewed is outdoors um but it, uh yeah it, I, we were just so grateful that people you know, you know, allowed us to film them and sort of share their stories and their perspectives. I mean, I, I think to me that was, they helped paint what a tragedy this was when you saw how amazing this place was and what was lost, you know, like I, it really was this like magical um, community that was so different. You know, I, I think one of the things that I've always been attracted to is that people that think different, live differently. And, and, you know, from going back 20 years of just making documentaries of highlighting people that are true visionaries or just see the world in a way that none of us, none of us do. And I, I felt like Sarma definitely fit into that um, category. You know, she created something so unique and different and um, in such a great environment and world. And I, and I find those stories always to be really inspiring and, you know, you, just to think of what you can do, that you can think differently from everyone else and, and and create something unique and special and like memorable. And, you know, it's like everything in a world where everything's getting more and more homogenized, you know, when you go to different towns and everything looks the same, you would see something like pure food and wine, which is like just so different, you know? And so anyways, um, but going back to the characters, I mean, it, yeah, it was, she had surrounded herself with an incredible cast of characters, you know, from the Jeffrey who was just so gracious in terms of, you know, I thought he really communicated the betrayal that he felt, you know, I think regardless of sort of, I think what we tried to do is help you understand how it got to that point, but you seeing the, the collateral damage of this experience to, you know, people that were living paycheck to paycheck that couldn't pay rent and things like that, you know, you can say like, Oh, you lost a job, big deal. But it's like, you know, if that's your whole existence, it's it is a big deal, you know. And I think that a lot of those people are really upset and really hurt. And I don't think a lot of them have heard from Sarma since all that happened. And so it's um, you know, it anyhow, it was it was it was an interesting balancing act to try to put all these disparate sort of experiences that uh resulted from being around this experience together in a way that felt like it gave justice to all the different sides. I think you did a, a, a really great job at, at really like also talking about a certain amount of privilege and like the people that do have some privilege and the people that do have not and like really including those like the other side of the coin is like the, the people that really get affected by all this are like the people that are like you said like living from paycheck to paycheck so I thought that was really important and really well portrayed in the film uh, in the series. So yeah, so thank you for that also, because uh, you know lab labor rights like and daily struggles of the working class are not usually represented in this kind of like large, you know, larger than life narratives of like you know rise and fall of of, of people with certain amount of power or influence, right? Um, so it, you know, on that note, uh, is there anything else that you want? Like, if if anyone has not seen the series yet, um, is there any anything like any particular like? Last thought that you want to leave us with? No, I'm I'm happy. No, I thought that was very good questions. Uh, <laughs> it's thank funny you. Being, it's funny being on the other side of it. You know, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, I try to avoid it as much as I can. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, I mean mostly because we're just working. But no, I really appreciate the time and 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 thoughtful questions and 
yeah, just a dialogue. So um, thanks so much.